I've been really wanting to do this message on Joel Olstein. The uh, Your Worst Life Now is what it's going to be called. And I bought a copy of his book, Your Best Life Now, two Wednesdays ago from a Goodwill store here in Pennsylvania. You'd think that they could ship a book from Pennsylvania to Pennsylvania, you know, in a week, maybe, a couple days. Still not here. So, you know, maybe, I don't know, maybe Satan knows I'm going to be doing the message and he sent some of his little servants along or something. They're going to hold it hostage or something. Look at this little handwritten note. You know, we have your book. I don't know. So, had a request to do a message on the charismatics. That's what we're going to be talking about today. Before we get started, though, I want to do a little another. I'll do these occasionally, probably not every week, but another little prophecy update. Uh, just kind of an interesting little statistic here. Years and years ago, I, what was it, 2002 or 2003 when we started when we went to war with Iraq? 2003. 2003. November, October, November 2003. Well, but the official invasion started in March because there's a reason for that. And, you know, this is an interesting thing. Maybe it's coincidence, maybe not. But the Greek god Mars, which they say March is named after, he was the god of war. And so a lot of the pagans would wait till the month of March to go to war so that their god would bless them. So are we going to go to war with Iran in March? I don't know. <laughs> If we do, I'll tell you what, it's not going to be a, a good thing. It's going to be pretty bad because, you know, we're not fighting with a bunch of gorillas or something like that running around. It's a very powerful country, and it has very powerful allies. And it's kind of interesting. I had a somebody write to me a while back, and they had a bunch of subjects that I should they'd like to hear a sermon on, and one of them was how to prepare for World War III. Well, how do you prepare for World War III as a Christian? Well, about the same way that you'd prepare for an accident. <laughs> Driving down the road and somebody pulls out in front of you and you lock up the brakes and you realize, I'm not going to stop in time and there's nowhere to go either side of the road. What do you do? Brace for, impra brace for impact. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> so, how do you prepare for World War III? Brace for impact. Pray. Trust the Lord. Hey, if we get nuked, well, that's a quick way to heaven. <laughs> so, with that happy positive thing here this morning, let's get into the message. Now, the title of this message is going to sound like I'm being very mean, but I'm not. It's called the Corrupt Charismatic Cult. Now, I'm not being insulting here. Those are actual descriptions of what the charismatic movement is. Webster's 1828 Dictionary defines corrupt as, there's five different definitions here, changed from a sound to a putrid state as by natural decomposition. Spoiled, tainted, vitiated, unsound as corrupt air or bread. Depraved, vitiated, tainted with wickedness. That'll be important later. Debased, rendered impure, changed to a worse state as corrupt language, not genuine, infected with errors or mistakes, as in the text is corrupt. All right, now, what about the word charismatic? Well, actually, it doesn't appear in the 1828 dictionary. There's no charismatic back then. But it, So I had to go online and get it here. Uh, charismatic, it says, of, relating to, or con con constituting charisma or charism as in charismatic gifts. Number two, having, exhibiting, or based on charisma, or charism, uh, charismatic leader, and they have a couple other things there, and they talk about uh, examples of charismatic leader, whatever, whatever. First known use, circa 1868. So there you have your definition of the word uh, char charismatic. What about cult? Again, it didn't appear in the 1828 dictionary, although they say first known use here, on the Webster's Online Dictionary, first known use is 1617. I don't know why Webster didn't include it in his dictionary, but that's why it was. Uh, a couple definitions here, five different ones. Formal religious veneration, a system of religious uh, beliefs and ritual, also its body of adherence, a religion regarded as unorthodox or spurious, also its body of in adherence, a system for the cure of disease based on dogma set forth by its promulgator, uh, great devotion devotion to a person, idea, object, movement, or work. And that's enough for that. Now, does the modern charismatic movement fall into that category? Well, we're going to see about that. Now, what was the foundation of this modern charismatic movement? A lot of people will say it's the Azusa Street Revival back in the early 1900s out in California. Now, is that true? Well, yes and no. The modern charismatic system, yes, but the strange things that people were doing, no. 
It actually existed before then. And I'm going to show you here. I have a book, The Autobiography of Peter Cartwright, the Backwoods Preacher. Peter Cartwright was a circuit-riding Methodist preacher. He was born in the late 1700s. Uh, he got saved, and I do believe he was a saved man. He, he's quite heretical in some of his beliefs, but I do believe he was a Christian. All right, but he went around, and he was one of the ones that started. He was one of the early preachers in the camp meetings, the big revival meetings. And some of the stuff that was going on there, a lot of people are not aware of. And, you know, when you're young, as a Christian, and you're starting to learn things, you'll hear about the great heroes of the faith. And they are heroes of the faith. I consider him a, a, a good man. But that doesn't mean that they were perfect. All right? And I'm not going to bash the guy and call him a heretic and say he was lost like some of the brethren might, but he had some issues. And you're going to see, in fact, that the modern charismatic system actually did not begin with the Pentecostals. It began with the Methodists. Now, I didn't know, I wasn't aware of that until I actually did this study, but you're going to see that today. And in fact, a lot of the 20th century charismatics were Methodists and not Pentecostals. We're going to see about that. Start out here, uh, page 32 of this book by Peter Cartwright. And this is his autobiography, by the way. He wrote it. This is not written about him. And, uh, Peter Cartwright, as a Methodist, he did not like Baptists for two reasons. Because Baptists believe in baptism by immersion, as the Bible teaches. You know, there's no sprinkling in the Bible. That's ridiculous. And secondly, we believe in eternal security. And the old-time Methodists did not. They were very much opposed to eternal security. So I'm going to read a couple quotes here. Uh, he says here, They adopted the mode of immersion, the water god of all exclusive errorists. <laughs> Uh, and then he's talking about how that some of the people, you know, that they got into other denominations and stuff that weren't Methodist. And this is what he says. Uh, and finally made shipwreck of the faith, fell back, turned infidel, and lost their religion and their souls forever. Oh, and give me a break. Nonsense. Absolute nonsense. You are sealed unto the day of redemption. You're not going to lose your salvation. Give me a break. Fall back and lose your religion and your soul. Yeah. But continuing here, page 45. And here he gets into the great revivals. Uh, this is in the early 1800s. And it says here, I have seen more than a hundred sinners fall like dead men under one powerful sermon. So people were falling down with the preaching? You say, oh yeah, brother, the power of God was mighty in those revivals. Well, how about the Acts chapter 2 revival? And by the way, the word revival, I don't really recall reading that in the Bible. You know, if, if uh, somebody falls down and they're, and they're dead or whatever, and you do CPR or something, or you shock them or whatever, you say you revived them. You revive a corpse. <laughs> you don't need to revive a living body. Oh, the great revivals. Well, I don't know about that, but, you know, where's this whole thing there? They had 3,000 souls saved in Acts chapter 2. Did any of them fall down? No. Peter preached to them and they said, what must, we do, what, what must we do to be saved? They didn't wham, hit the ground and Peter came over and, you know, knocking them on the head or something. Be slain in the spirit. You know. exactly, yeah. What is this stuff? Continuing on here to the next page, page 46. Now listen to some of this stuff. Now if you've seen some of the modern charismatic movement, they'll do things, they fall down, they do this slate in, in, in the spirit thing, they make weird noises, they'll crawl around on their hands acting like animals, Barking, yelling, laughing, doing all kinds of weird things. And people say, well, that started at the Azusa Street Revival. No, it didn't. Page 46. In this great revival, the Methodists kept moderately balanced, for we had excellent preachers to steer the ship or guide the flock. But some of our members ran wild and indulged in some extravagances that were hard to control. The Presbyterian preachers and members, not being accustomed to much noise or shouting, when they yielded to it, went into great extremes and downright wildness to the great injury of the cause of God. Turning your Bible this morning to 1 Corinthians chapter 14. Now, was there a group of Christians that were doing this kind of thing in the Bible? Yeah. And we're going to see here what Paul said to them. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 23. It says here, if therefore the whole church be come together into one place, like they would have done at a camp meeting, 
and all speak with tongues, and there come in those that are unlearned or unbelievers, will they not say that ye are mad? Now, is that a good thing? Is Paul saying that you should do that? No, he's rebuking them. And by the way, tongues there means languages. It's not some other kind of thing, but you know, it'd be like the Tower of Babel all over again. You know, that's not what the Lord wants. He wants order. We're going to see that in just a little bit here as we continue. Jump over here to page 48. Now this is where it really gets weird. Very, very bizarre. The Peter Cartwright book here. Just in the midst of our controversies on the subject of the power exercises among the people under preaching, a new exercise broke out among us called the jerks, which was overwhelming in its effects upon the bodies and minds of the people, no matter whether they were saints or sinners. Uh, so the Holy Spirit's coming down on saints and sinners? Uh -huh. Little problem there. They would be taken under a warm song or sermon and seized with a convulsive jerking all over, which they could not by any possibility avoid, and the more they, resist, the more they resisted, the more they jerked. If they would not strive against it and pray in good earnest, the jerking would usually abate. Now, if it's the Holy Spirit that comes down on you, and you start you know, shaking and going into convulsions, why does prayer stop it? Think about it. It's not the Holy Spirit. Continuing here. I have seen more than 500 persons jerking at one time in my large congregations, most usually pe persons taken with the jerks to obtain relief, as they said, would rise up and dance. Some would run, but could not get away. Some would resist, on such the jerks were generally very severe. To see these proud young gentlemen and young ladies dressed in their silks, jewelry, and prunella, not even sure what that is, from top to toe, Take the jerks would often excite my risibilities. <laughs> Whatever that means. Uh, the first jerk or so, you would see their fine bonnets, caps, and combs fly, and so sudden would be the jerking of the head that their long, loose hair would crack almost as loud as a wagoneer's whip. Now, what does that resemble? That resembles, resembles the modern charismatic movement. The Toronto blessing and some of this stuff, these wild movements. I mean, just look it up online. I mean, it's just... It's vexing to even watch this stuff because it's just the power of Satan in there among these people. It's it's possession with devils. You don't see this stuff in the Bible. You don't see people jerking and convulsing and stuff and, you know, oh, it's the Holy Spirit's coming on down. No. Actually, you do see it in the Bible. We're going to talk about that in a little bit. Uh, then they had a, a thing here where four kids from the same family came in and it says uh, here, the two young gentlemen moved off to the yard fence and both the young ladies took the jerks and they were greatly mortified about it. You know, the Holy Spirit comes into a young woman and she starts going into convulsions and she's she's mortified about it, but it's the Holy Spirit? Uh, yeah, I don't think so. Uh, page number 50 through 51 here. I'll read this quick. While I am on this subject, I will relate a very serious circumstance which I knew to take place with a man who had the jerks at a camp meeting on what was called the Ridge in William McGee's congregation. There was a great work of religion in the encampment. The jerks were very prevalent. <laughs> There was a company of drunken rowdies who came to interrupt the meeting. These rowdies were headed by a very large drinking man. They came with their bottles of whiskey in their pockets. This large man cursed the jerks and all religion. Shortly afterward, he took the jerks, and he started to run, but he jerked so powerfully he could not get away. He halted among some saplings, and although he was violently agitated, he took out his bottle of whiskey and swore he would drink the damned jerks to death. But he jerked at such a rate he could not get the bottle to his mouth, though he tried hard. At length he fetched a sudden jerk, and the bottle struck a sapling and was broken to pieces and spilled his whiskey on the ground. There was a great crowd gathered round him, and when he lost his whiskey, he became very much enraged and cursed and swore very profanely, his jerk still increasing. At length he fetched a very violent jerk, snapped his neck, fell and soon expired with his mouth full of cursing and bitterness. I always looked upon the jerks as a judgment sent from God, first to bring sinners to repentance, and secondly, to show professors that God could work with or without means, and that he could work over and above means, uh, and do whatsoever seemeth him good, to the glory of his grace and the salvation of the world. Now, what's the name of this little fellowship we have here? Bible Believers. Bible Believers Fellowship. Now, how do you respond to something like that? Very simple. Three, ver three words, exactly. Yeah. Chapter and verse. Oh, God can use the, the jerks to bring people to his glory. Chapter and verse. Well, I've seen it. I've seen the mighty... Hey, I don't care what you've seen. I don't care what you've experienced. I don't care what you feel. Where's it at in Scripture? Well, it's not really in there, but God's doing something new. I don't think so. 
I don't think so. <laughs> Just ridiculous. Now we're going to go to Mark chapter 9. And as I said a little bit earlier here, are there any people that, that get the jerks in the Bible? Well, we're going to see about that. Mark chapter 9, verse 17. Now, as we read down through this, keep in mind the list of things that we just heard about there at these revival meetings, and keep in mind what goes on in these charismatic churches. Okay, Mark chapter 9, verse 17. And one of the multitude answered and said, Master, I have brought unto thee my son, which hath a dumb spirit. And wheresoever he taketh him, he teareth him, and he foameth, and gnasheth with his teeth, and pineth away. And I spake to thy disciples that they should cast him out, and they could not. He answereth him, and saith, O faithless generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I suffer you? Bring him unto me. And they brought him unto him, and when he saw him, straightway, straightway the spirit tear him, and he fell on the ground, and wallowed, foaming. And he asked his father, How long is it ago since he came to the revival meeting? Oh, no, it doesn't say that. It says, How long ago since uh, this, this came unto him? And he said, Of a child. And oftentimes it hath cast him into the fire and into the waters to destroy him. But if thou canst do anything, have compassion on us and help us. Jesus said unto him, If thou canst believe, all things are possible to him that believeth. Now, he doesn't say all things are possible and that we should say that this is good, what your son's going through. He says all things are possible, meaning I can heal the guy. I can heal this, this child here, this boy. That's what he's saying there. Don't use these verses out of context. Verse 24, And straightway the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe. <laughs> Help thou mine unbelief. <laughs> You know, that's a good picture right there of a praying Christian. Lord, I believe you can answer my prayer. And then you go, no, you can't, you know, in your mind. Help thou mine unbelief. Got to work on that. Verse 25. When Jesus saw that the people came running together, he rebuked the foul spirit, saying unto him, Thou dumb and deaf spirit, I charge thee, come out of him, and enter no more into him. And the spirit cried and rent him sore, and came out of him, and he was as one dead, insomuch that many said, He is dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him up, and he arose. And when his disciples came, uh, and when he was come into the house, his disciples asked him privately, "Why could not we cast him out?" And he said unto him, or unto them, "This kind can come forth but by nothing but by prayer and fasting." Prayer and fasting is removed from the new versions a lot of times. The NIV totally takes out the term prayer and fasting. And I did a video on that a while back. You actually look at the the book that the translators of the NIV put out, and the one guy said that fasting is magic. It's manipulating God and not true religion what one of the NIV translators said. It's in the video. But you see there the symptoms of being possessed with the devil. Crying and foaming and you know tearing yourself and stuff and bruising yourself and falling on the ground. And yet that's what's going on in these revival meetings. But it's the Holy Spirit at the revival meetings? Sorry, I don't believe that. Luke chapter 9, verse 37 through 42, we're not going to go there, but it's the same story told again. And... Uh, it's a little bit shorter in that in that passage. But the point is there are three different things there, three different main things that you'll see with that uh, young boy that was possessed with devils. Sudden crying out. What's that mean? Well, no control over the mouth. You ever hear some of these revival meetings? Sudden crying out. Oh, but they're saying glory to God. Sometimes. Sometimes they just cry out. Sometimes they'll just scream and they won't say anything. Oh, it's out of the Lord. I don't know about that. Secondly, you have being torn and foaming at the mouth. What's that? No control over the mind? You're supposed to have control over the mind. You're supposed to bring every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. All right? What about being bruised by falling down and going into convulsions? Well, no control over the flesh. And you see these charismatics, these big churches and stuff like that. Those are the three things that you'll see with those people. No control over their mouth. They'll talk real holy and nice and stuff in the churches. They go out, they talk totally different. No control over the mind. They don't think about the things of the Lord, the things of Scripture. And a lot of these guys, these, these big faith healer guys, they have absolutely no conscience at all. No control over the mind. They'll just let the devils come in and just take over. They'll see some old little old lady in a wheelchair and they'll, they'll say to themselves, how can I get her money? They don't have any control over their mind. What about control over the flesh? A lot of these guys, you know, you hear these charismatics and stuff, you know, oh, brother so-and-so, yeah, he's not the pastor here anymore. He ran off with another man's wife. And this one over here, he ran off with this guy over there, you know. Right. You know, 
uh, man with a man. I mean, right. You know, Paul Crouch came out a couple of years ago, the big, you know, cell evangelist on TBN, and he was, you know, the white guy, married to a, a woman that looked like a transvestite, but whatever, and he was messing around with a black man, a male prostitute, you know? What was a uh, Kenneth Copeland, or not Kenneth Copeland, uh, uh, Hagen, or whatever that guy's name was? I can't think of his name. But it was a, he was the head of the evangelical movement or something like this, and he was messing around with a male prostitute, taking methamphetamine for a couple of years. Wow. What's going on? No control over the flesh. If it feels good, do it. That's what's going on in these places. But uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 26. Go back to 1 Corinthians. What kind of an atmosphere should there be among God's people? And when you listen to these messages here at Bible Believers Fellowship, what kind of things are you hearing? You're not hearing a lot of yelling or shouting or people getting up or running around or anything, mainly because I'd probably shoot the people. <laughs> Anybody, if they got up and ran, you know, I'd say, well, keep running, run out the door there and don't come back. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 26. How is it then, brethren, when ye come together, every one of you hath a psalm, hath a doctrine, hath a tongue, hath a revelation, hath an interpretation. Let all things be done unto edifying. I actually had a modern charismatic write to me the one time, and he said, Paul is telling them to do these things. Everybody's supposed to have a psalm, a doctrine, a, you know, all this stuff. And I said, that's not it. It starts with a question. In other words, why are you doing this? This is wrong. You shouldn't be doing this. That's what Paul's saying. He's not exhorting them to do these things, to have this organization. Jump down to verse 32. And the spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets. Did you know you're supposed to have yourself under control? Why, well, the Holy Spirit came upon me and I just couldn't control myself. That's not what Scripture says. If the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you shouldn't have any trouble keeping your flesh in line. In fact, it's the exact opposite of what this charismatic stuff was. These uncontrollable jerks that they had back there in these revival meetings. That's not the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit comes upon you. It should be, I can keep myself in line. I'm not going to look at that scantily clad woman over there. I'm not going to lust after this. I'm not going to covet after that. The Holy Spirit comes in and he, gets you, he helps you control your flesh. That's why a saved person should be able to avoid sin better than somebody who's lost. Because somebody who's lost doesn't have the help of the Holy Spirit. The Spirit of the prophets are subject to the prophets. You are supposed to keep your body in subjection and keep your spirit, you know, too. I mean, God's spirit's not going to have you do erratic, weird things. Verse 33, For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace as in all churches of the saints. You know why a lot of those people came to those revival meetings back then? Talked about the drunks and stuff. They came to laugh at the people. Why? Because the people were acting like animals. And you think about that time period back then, early 1800s, the people were very, very proper. The women wore long dresses, the men, you know, dressed in suits and ties almost all the time. I mean, people were very proper. And then you get these people, these same people that are proper, rolling around on the floor and stuff and running around and shaking and everything. Clothes flying off. Yeah, clothes flying off, getting up and dancing around because you got the, the twitches. I mean, jerks. what is this stuff? The jerks. Yeah, I was just adding to it. You know, I was doing updated reading there. Verse 34, Let your women keep silence in the churches, for it is not permitted unto them to speak, but they are commanded to be under obedience, as also saith the law. And if they will learn anything, let them ask their husbands at home, for it is a shame for women to speak in the church. Remember these verses. It will be important later. What? Came the word of God out from you, or came it unto you only? If any man think himself to be a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge that the things that I write unto you are the commandments of the Lord. Paul's saying chapter and verse. It's the written scripture that's your final authority. Verse 38. But if any man be ignorant, let him be ignorant. We're going to see about that later too. There are a lot of these charismatics, a lot of the modern ones. They're ignorant and they don't want to be changed. They will not listen to you. They don't care what the Bible says. Hey, if any man be ignorant, let him be ignorant. See ya. Verse 39. Wherefore, brethren, covet to prophesy and forbid not to speak with tongues. Let all things be done decently and in order. When the saints meet together, there should be things should be done decently and there should be order to the service. You don't have to have it regimented that you do it the same way all the time. You get into a rut that way and you start just worship becomes vain. But there should be order 
to a service. And you say, well, look there, though. It says, forbid not to speak with tongues. We don't. I'm speaking in tongues right now. The English tongue. If somebody wants to come in here and speak in German or Russian or whatever else, well, you're going to have to interpret that. You're going to have to tell us what you're saying, you know. But we don't forbid to speak with tongues. We forbid to speak with languages. Is the word there? I think I'm done with that one. All right, I think we're going to go on to the next one here. And and by the way, before I before I do go on to the next thing here, what was the problem with the big revival meetings? Well, the fact that they were big. Yeah. You see, more people equals more flesh. <laughs> more flesh equals more sin. <laughs> you know? So, what kind of churches are the best? Small churches. There's less flesh to deal with. Now, I've probably gone over this before, but we're going to hit it one more time. Colossians chapter 4, verse 7. Got a lot of other articles to read here, so I got to really keep moving. But uh, there's definitely a lot of rabbit trails I could hit this morning. Well, the other thing too, Brian, is you don't have to save the lost together. Yeah, you know? yeah, the save and lost thing together, you know, and and like that revival meeting, the Holy Spirit's coming down on all of them, you know, and they're all getting the jerks. Eh, I don't think so. Colossians chapter four, verse seven. Now here Paul is writing. Now we're going to see Paul's uh, ministerial team that he has. I want you to count, all right? All my state shall. Tychicus, there's one, declare unto you who is a beloved brother and a faithful minister and fellow servant in the Lord, whom I have sent unto you for the same purpose that he might know your estate and comfort your hearts, with Onesimus, number two, a faithful and beloved brother who is one of you, that they, they shall make known unto you all things which are done here. Aristarchus, number three, my fellow prisoner saluteth you. And Marcus, number four, sister's son to Barnabas, touching whom ye have received commandments, if he come unto you, receive him. And Jesus, which is called Justice, number five, who are of the circumcision. There were two Jesuses in the Bible, by the way. <laughs> One is, is God manifest in the flesh, the other is just a, a man. But uh, continuing here, look at the rest of the verse. These only are my fellow workers unto the kingdom of God, which have been a comfort unto me. So the great Apostle Paul, how many men did he have working with him? Five. In other words, Paul's little fellowship that he had there that and they weren't even around all the time he's you know sending them out places his fellowship that he had was six people including himself now we usually have more than that here on a sunday morning you know <laughs> oh we're so small we got to get big and everything mm. nope don't be ashamed of your small congregation big churches lead to big problems keep that in mind now we see there from the Peter Cartwright book that some of these early camp meetings, these early revival meetings, they had that charismatic spirit thing there where people were going into convulsions, which I believe was was demonic in nature. I don't believe it was the Holy Spirit. You don't I mean, show me from scripture. All right? I don't see it. But they they had that there. But then what happened at the Azusa Street revival? I'm going to read about that here. And uh, this is where the charismatic Actions and activities that were going on in the camp meetings, they kicked into high gear at this point in time. And keep in mind, too, while I'm reading this, the Bible prophesied that there would come a falling away in the last days. If this is a good movement, why did it just show up in the last hundred years? You know, right when the Bible says things would fall apart, the charismatic movement begins. Here we have, this is an article from Wikipedia. And, you know, I know people say, oh, you can't trust everything from Wikipedia. I know that. But this article covers this movement well and it is very well documented but uh, let's I'll read this here get through this as quick as I can the Azusa Street Revival was a historic Pentecostal revival meeting that took place in Los Angeles California and is the origin of the Pentecostal movement uh, not totally true I'm going to get into that just in a little bit it was led by C William J. Seymour an African American preacher it began with a meeting on April 14th 1906 and continued until roughly 1915 the revival was characterized by ecstatic spiritual experiences accompanied by miracles, dramatic worship services, speaking in tongues, and interracial mingling. The participants were criticized by the secular media and the Christian theologians for behaviors considered to be outrageous and unorthodox, especially at the time. Today, today the revival is considered by historians to be the primary catalyst for the spread of Pentecostalism in the 20th century. Now, let me just stop there for just one minute. There are Pentecostal churches that have not adopted all the movements of charismania. <laughs> you know, 
there are some that are out there. I've been contacted by a couple brethren, and they're like, we don't do the crazy radical stuff. We do believe in the sign gifts, but we aren't, you know, doing cartwheels down the aisles and rolling around on the floor. That stuff's an abomination. So you can't just, like, blanket statement, you know, nail all the Pentecostals. And remember, it was not the Pentecostals that started it, mainly because the Pentecostals weren't around, you know, way back in the early 1800s. They kind of showed up late 1800s, early 1900s, right around that time period. Uh, they were actually originally called holiness churches. Continuing here. In 1904, the Welsh, Welsh revival took place during which approximately 100,000 people in Wales joined the movement. Internationally, evangelical Christians took this event to be a sign that a fulfillment of the prophecy in the Bible's book of Joel, chapters 2, verse 23 through 29, was about to take place. Peter refers to that in Acts chapter 2 about that in the last days your young men shall see dreams and, you know, all that stuff. Which, you know, that's not going to happen until after the rapture, I believe. But uh, continuing here, Joseph Smale, pastor of the First Baptist Church in Los Angeles, went to Wales personally in order to witness the revival. Upon his return to Los Angeles, he attempted to ignite a similar event in his own congregation. Hmm. He attempted. Right. Yeah, not the Holy Spirit. His attempts were short-lived, <laughs> and he eventually left First Baptist Church to found First New Testament Church, where he continued his efforts. During this time, other small-scale revivals were taking place in Minnesota, North Carolina, and Texas. By 1905, reports of speaking in tongues, supernatural healings, and significant lifestyle changes accompanied these revivals. As news spread, evangelicals across the United States began to pray for similar revivals in their own congregation. In 1905, William J. Seymour, the one-eyed 34-year-old son of former slaves, was a student of well-known Pentecostal preacher Charles Parham, an, iterum, an, interim, excuse me, an interim pastor for a small holiness church in Houston, Texas. Neely Terry, an African-American woman who attended a small holiness church pastored by Julia Hutchins, the Bible say there in First Corinthians about a woman being silent in the church. Ooh, problem there. Uh, made a trip to visit family in Houston late in 1905. While in Houston, she visited Seymour's church, where he preached the baptism of the Holy Spirit with his evidence of speaking in tongues. And I'm not going to read all this here, but it goes on to say basically that he didn't, he wasn't speaking in tongues yet, so the people weren't really following him, and so they kind of set up their own thing, and they began to, to pray that they could speak in tongues, and they started to, you know, amazing. And then they, they were meeting in a home initially, and they started to get a crowd, you know, people come to see the freak show. I mean, a uh, um, uh, worship service, yeah. And it says here, soon the crowds became very large and were full of people speaking in tongues, shouting, singing, and moaning. That's spiritual. Finally, the front porch collapsed, forcing the group to begin looking for a new meeting place. A resident of the neighborhood described the happenings at 214 North Bonnie Bray with the following words. They shouted three days and three nights. It was Easter season. The people came from everywhere. By the next morning, there was no way of getting near the house. As people came in, they would fall under God's power and the whole city was stirred. They shouted under the foundation of the house gave way, but no one was hurt. <laughs> Why not? They <laughs> Just heal them. <laughs> but... Uh, <laughs> This next part cracks me up. They go into this thing. They they found this uh, 312 Azusa Street, Los Angeles, California. They found this old dilapidated building, and they went in there, and they, they the ceilings were only eight foot high or something, so they couldn't have a, a raised platform with a pulpit and stuff on it. So uh, Brother Seymour, it says here, generally sat behind two empty shoe boxes, one on top of the other. He usually kept his head inside the top one during the meeting. <laughs> and it goes, uh, oh, I'll read. I'll get back into this in a minute. <clears throat> and, you know, then it, it goes into some of the radical things that they were putting out there, and it says the group's encouragement of women in leadership was one of the things that they were known for, early 1900s. Uh, this is what the Los Angeles Times wrote about them. Quote, meetings are held in a tumble-down shack on Azusa Street, and the devotees of the weird doctrine practice the most fanatical rites, preach the wildest theories, and work themselves into a state of mad excitement in their peculiar zeal. Collared people and a sprinkling of whites compose the congregation, and night is made hideous in the neighborhood by the howlings of the worshipers, who spend hours swaying forth and back in a nerve-wracking attitude of prayer and supplication. They claim to have the gift of tongues and be able to understand the babble. What did the Bible say there in 1 Corinthians about those that come in that are lost? They come in and they say that you're mad. Right there it is. It's not a movement of the Holy Spirit. Continuing on here. 
Singing was sporadic and in a cappella or occasionally in tongues. Uh, chapter and verse. Where in the Bible does it say that you're supposed to sing in tongues? <laughs> uh, it doesn't. There were periods of extended silence. Attenders were occasionally slain in the spirit. Yeah. Visitors gave their testimony. The members read aloud testimonies that were sent to the mission by mail. There was prayer for the gift of tongues. There was prayer in tongues for the sick, for missionaries, and whatever requests were given by attenders or mailed in. Uh, it goes on and on and on here. Uh, many people would continually shout throughout the meetings. What did it say there? The guy would just, uh, the young boy would just shout out uncontrollably. And it was devils that were in him. But what about this Charles Parham guy? Well, he was getting greedy and he wanted to get in on this whole thing and whatever. But uh, it says here, By October of 1906, Charles Parham was invited to speak for a series of meetings at Azusa Street, but was quickly uninvited. Several reasons can be given for Azusa Street's dissatis or disassociation from him. Firstly, Parham had personal conflicts with Seymour and wanted to be the chief authority figure of the movement. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. A little bit of pride entering in there. Yeah. Uh, but the presiding leaders of the apostolic faith mission were slow to make any changes in their methods of leadership. Now look at this. And this is 1906. Secondly, rumors were surfacing that Parham had been committing sodomy with young males. Oh, that's disgusting. So there you have the guy that, that taught the man that began this whole you know, movement. And then here's more criticism. Local paper in 1906, September 1906, said, quote, Disgraceful intermingling of the races. They cry and make howling noises all day and into the night. They run, jump, shake all over, shout at the top of their voice, spin around in circles, fall out on the sawdust blanketed floor, jerking, kicking, and rolling over it. Sometimes, or some of them pass out and do not move for hours as though they were dead. These people appear to be mad, mentally deranged, or under a spell. They claim to be filled with the spirit. They have a one-eyed, illiterate Negro as their preacher who stays on his knees much of the time with his head hidden between the wooden milk crates. He doesn't talk very much, but at times he can be heard shouting, Repent! <laughs> and he's supposed to be running the thing. <laughs> they repeatedly sing the same song, The Comforter Has Come. Okay. Yeah, I'm not going to do it. I was going to do it, but I'm not going to. I was going to stick my head in the pulpit here and yell, Repent, but I guess I won't. <laughs> I won't bless you with that. But, you know, that's the pastor. The pastor's up front sitting there with his head in a box, you know, the whole time and yelling, repent. Where's this stuff at in Scripture? Uh, after Seymour died of a heart attack on September 28, 1922, his wife Jenny led the church until 1931 when the congregation lost the building. Now, here's where it gets interesting. Um, and it talks about the whole Pentecostal movement and how it really took off after that. Other new missions were based on preachers who had charisma and energy. Remember what we read there, the charismatic thing? Mm -hmm. Now, is that a standard for a preacher? No. You have to have charisma and you have to modulate your voice and you have to speak with great authority and all this stuff. That's charisma. That's a charismatic speaker. That's what these guys are. And you know, I covered that in the whole thing of the, the carnival preachers, the carnival churches. That's all it is. It's appealing to the flesh. But now listen to this. Many existing Wesleyan holiness denominations adopted the Pentecostal message. Wesleyan. John Wesley, founder of the Methodist Church. Today there are more than 500 million Pentecostal and charismatic believers across the globe, and it is the fastest growing form of Christianity today. The Azusa Street Revival is commonly regarded as the beginning of the modern day Pentecostal movement. And most churches that are Pentecostal do line up with that whole thing. Some aren't as radical. They don't do all that weird stuff, but some are. And, and you know, I just want to make a point before we continue. There are a lot of these modern charismatic movements that are so wild, I don't even want to talk about it. I mean, they're, they're doing things that are such abominations. It's just, it's vexing to even hear what these people are doing. How did it all start? All with those horrible Pentecostals. No, it actually started with the Methodists. Now I want to talk about... A guy here, probably one of the, the leading Pentecostal charismatics that ever lived, a man who really pushed them into the forefront, a man named Oral Roberts. Uh, it says here, uh, this is again from Wikipedia, a little thing about him. 
His healing ministry and bringing American Pentecostalism into the mainstream had the most impact, but he also pioneered TV evangelism and laid the foundations of the prosperity gospel and abundant life teachings, which he very much did. Uh, Roberts originally made a name for himself with a large mobile tent that sat 3,000 on metal folding chairs where he shouted at petitioners who did not respond to his healing. <laughs> 1947 came as a turning point. Up until that time, Roberts had struggled as a part-time preacher in Oklahoma, but at the age of 29, Roberts claimed he picked up his Bible and it fell open at the third epistle of John, where verse 2 read, I wish above all things, <clears throat> I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health, even as thy soul prospereth. Now, just stop there for one minute. You know who else used to do that? He would make decisions just by going like this with his Bible and going, uh, uh, uh. Oh, okay, what's the verse there? You don't do it that way. You compare Scripture with Scripture. Search the Scriptures daily to see if these things are so, like the Brians. You don't just, I mean, that's it's almost a form of witchcraft or divination. I'm just going to flop the Bible open and point, and then that's my verse I'm going to base doctrine on. You don't do that. But guess who else used to do that? It's famous for it. John Wesley, founder of the Methodist Church. Hmm. I wonder if it's the same spirit telling him to do that. But uh, Roberts, it says here, Roberts decided immediately that it was all right to be rich. The next day, he said he bought a Buick and God appeared, he said, telling him to heal the sick. Isn't that something? <laughs> Roberts resigned his pastoral ministry with the Pentecostal Holiness Church to found Oral Roberts Evangelistic Association. He conducted evangelistic and faith healing crusades across America and around the world. Thousands of sick people would wait in line to stand before Oral Roberts so he could pray for them. He appeared, appeared as a guest speaker for hundreds of national and international meetings and conventions. Through the years, he conducted more than 300 crusades on six continents and personally laid hands in prayer on more than two million people. He also ran direct mail campaigns of seed faith, mm -hmm. which appealed to poor Americans, often from ethnic minorities. At its peak in the early 1980s, Roberts was the leader of a $120 million a year organization employing 2,300 people. This spanned not only a university, but also a medical school and hospital, as well as building a building on 50 acres south of Tulsa, uh, valued at $500 million. Um, if you can heal, why would you build a medical center? A <laughs> uh, little problem there. On 17th of March, 1968, Roberts and his wife were received as members of the Boston Avenue United Methodist Church in Tulsa, Oklahoma, by Dr. Finnis Crutchfield, then pastor. The United Methodist Church offered more leniency in doctrinal and moral issues than the Pentecostals. So in other words, Oral Roberts, after a while, he said, these Pentecostals are too strict. I'm going to go with the Methodists. Isn't that something? And again, we're back to the Methodists. You know, a lot of people put it all on, on the Pentecostals and just nail in. And I'm not a fan of Pentecostalism, but the point is, the Methodists are the ones that were the real instigators of this whole thing. Roberts became an elder in the Oklahoma Conference of the United Methodist Church. From 1968 through 1987, Roberts was a member of the United Methodist Church's ministry. Where's that at in the history books? You know, you don't hear about that much. I mean, a lot of the, the independent Baptists, they'll slam Pentecostals and everything. But, you know, oh, man, the Methodists, the old-time Methodists. Well, the old-time Methodists had some okay things about them. They had Sam Jones and Peter Cartwright, but they had some major problems. And who's, you know, what's going on now with the, the modern Methodists? They got the Book of Discipline, which is not a modern invention, by the way. That thing's always been there. John Wesley wrote it, the original one. And they will overthrow the Bible with the Book of Discipline. I have a buddy that... that saw that thing. They were talking about this lesbian pastor that wanted to marry her female partner. She's a Methodist preacher. And they said, well, we couldn't find anything in the Book of Discipline to, that condemns that. And my friend was like, but the Bible condemns it. Oh, yeah, well, you know, okay, you know. And John Wesley, by the way, was four female preachers. His mother preached, or she pastored the church different times when his father was away. Whatever just not right. Uh, but continuing on here with the article. In 1977, Roberts claimed to have had a vision from a 900-foot tall Jesus who told him to build City of Faith Medical and Research Center and the hospital would be a success. Keep that in mind. In 1980, Roberts said he had a, had a vision which encouraged him to continue the construction of the City of Faith 
a medical and research center in Oklahoma, which opened in 1981. At the time, it was among the largest health facilities of its kind in the world and was intended to merge prayer and medicine in the healing process. The City of Faith operated for only eight years before closing in late 1989. Wait a second. The 900-foot-tall Jesus told him it was going to be a success, and it closed in just eight years. What's he saying? If you would take him at his word, if you believe what Oral Roberts said, that 900-foot-tall Jesus lied to him. He didn't give a right prophecy. Now, do I believe that a 900-foot-tall Jesus spoke to him? No. Not at all. Um, in 1983, Roberts said Jesus appeared to him in person and commissioned him to find a cure for cancer. Isn't that what he died of? Oral Roberts? Didn't he die of cancer or something? Might have. I don't know. But uh, continuing on here, i got to skip a lot of this information because it's just so much. Uh, personal life. Roberts was married to Evelyn Lutman Fan, Fan Stock for 66 years from December 25, 1938 until her death from a fall at the age of 88. Their daughter, Rebecca Nash, died in an airplane crash on February 11, 1977 with her husband, businessman Marshall Nash. Listen to this. Their elder son, Ronald Roberts, committed suicide by shooting himself in the heart on 10th uh, June 1982, five months after receiving a court order to undergo counseling at a drug treatment center and six months after coming out as gay. The other two, daughter, or the other two Roberts' children are son Richard, an evangelist and former president of Oral Roberts University, and Robert Roberta Potts, an attorney. Roberts' gay grandson, Randy Roberts Potts, uh, talked about his uncle Ronald Roberts and wrote an article discussing growing up gay in the Oral Roberts family. What a godly heritage. And by the way, this uh, Richard Roberts, just like a, a week or two ago, was arrested. He was drunk and driving 93 miles an hour. You know, just like two weeks ago. And, you know, like a night or two afterwards, you know, he was he saw him on TV and he was praying over prayer cloths that had come in, you know, to heal people and stuff. The guy just got arrested for drunk driving. Yeah. yeah. Here's another thing. Quick, I'm going to read this. You say, well, I don't know. This charismatic movement, I think it's a wonderful thing. And I think it's the Holy Spirit coming on down, you know, and all this. How about the Catholic charismatic revival? The Catholic charismatic re renewal, excuse me, renewal, and not revival, but uh, is a movement within the Catholic Church. Worship is characterized by vibrant masses as well as prayer meetings featuring prophecy, healing, and praying in tongues. This movement is based on the belief that certain charismata bestowed by the Holy Spirit, such as the ability to pray in tongues and to heal, which Christians generally believe existed in the early church as described in the Bible, should still be practiced today. A Catholic church in Ann Arbor, Michigan, describes charismatic prayer. A charismatic style of prayer is common at Christ the King. People are free to raise their hands in prayer and during songs. Many pray their own prayers audibly. Some pray in tongues, etc., they pray with expressive or charismatic prayer at monthly parish prayer meetings, at the beginning of parish meetings, and most especially during certain moments in the Holy Mass. There are some of the external markers of, of or these are some of the external markers of a charismatic parish. Internal markers include a radical surrender to the Lordship of Jesus Christ in all parts of life, except salvation, of course, a strong adherence to the gospel and the teachings of the Catholic Church, and the pursuit of strong friendships centered on Christ. And it's interesting because it goes on talks about how this movement started in a Catholic university and then went over to Notre Dame and, you know, was in there. And one of the leading cardinals that endorsed it was also one of the four moderators of the Second Vatican Council. Interesting crowd there. As of 2003, the Catholic Charismatic Renewal exists in over 230 countries in the world, having touched over 119 million members. So when I'm talking about this charismatic, corrupt charismatic call, I'm not talking about a small movement of just some fringe, weird thing. We're talking hundreds of millions of people that are part of this. Uh, some Catholic charismatic communities conduct healing services, gospel power services, outreaches, and evangelizations where the presence of the Holy Spirit is felt and healings and miracles take place. <clears throat> We're going to get back into the miracles thing in just a minute here. Today, the Catholic charismatic renewal enjoys the strong support of the hierarchy from the Pope to bishops of diocese around the world as an officially recognized ecclesiastical movement. Right there. The Pope isn't saying, oh, this is wrong, this is horrible, you know. It's endorsed by the Pope. Now, if you're part of that movement, shouldn't that kind of disturb you a little bit? You know, what's the Holy Spirit? The Holy Spirit told me to do this stuff, and why are the Catholics doing it? 
Why back there in the, in the great revivals, the great camp meetings of the past with the Methodists, why was the Spirit coming upon saved and lost? Because it's not the Holy Spirit that these people are dealing with. Now what about this thing of miracles? Turning your Bible to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. I don't have a whole lot more to go here in this study this morning. There's a lot of material to cover. and I had to really skip quite a bit of it there. Just for sake of time, but... Uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 7. It says here, For the mystery of iniquity doth already work, only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. Speaking of the body of Christ. The Antichrist can't show up till the body of Christ leaves. Verse 8. And then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Read Revelation chapter 19, particularly at the end there. The beast and the false prophet. That's what's being written about here. Verse 9. Now look at this. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders. Can Satan perform miracles? Yes. The working of Satan is power, signs, and lying wonders. It's written right there. Oh, I was at this revival and we saw this great muddy power coming on the people. We saw miracles. Well, then you're seeing the working of Satan. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. You know the power of God? Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. God leads you into an understanding of Scripture. When the power of the Holy Spirit comes upon a Christian, when the Spirit of truth has come, He will guide you into all truth. I've seen the power of the Holy Spirit working on people. I've seen it. I've seen new believers and they come along and, and I'm, I show them my library and they're like, I'll take that book, I'll take that book, I'll take this video. Oh man, you know, it's just like you're in a candy store. You know, you just, you just want to, I, I want to learn, I want to study. Amen. Tell me, can you tell me about this? Do you have any sermons on that? Do you, you know, that's the power of the Holy Spirit. Not this, this nuttiness with this charismatic stuff. It's not the power of the Holy Spirit. Now when is this fulfilled? The verse is there. Revelation chapter 13. Revelation chapter 13, verse 11. Revelation chapter 13, verse 11. And I beheld in another... I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spake as a dragon. And he exerciseth all the power of the first beast before him, and causeth the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast, whose deadly wound was healed. And he doeth great wonders, so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men, and deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast, which had the wound by a sword and did live. You know, I've seen charismatic churches. There's one here locally out in uh, Mannheim where they have a sign out and they have people with their hands raised up and fire coming down from heaven. Seriously. You know, I've seen it. And you'll see that around now. No, talk about let's bring the fire on down. What's going to happen when the false prophet actually physically does it for these people? Yeah, they'll be deceived. They will worship the beast. And when you worship the beast and take his mark, there is absolutely no chance for you. You are lost. You are gone. You say, well, I thought you believed in a pre-tribulation rapture. I do. For saved people. <laughs> a lot of these people are lost. And right now they're, they're kind of feeling their way through. I'm getting ahead of myself. But they're feeling their way through this life and, and they don't care about what the Bible says. And so they're going to miss the rapture and they're going to, they're going to see these signs and wonders and the Antichrist is going to appear. I just put a message on Sermon Audio uh, last night. I put it on about the pre-tribulation rapture judgment. God's going to split the saved and the lost before his judgment comes. He always does. But the strong delusion that's going to come, I believe, is going to be the Antichrist, and I believe he's going to be a perfect counterfeit Christ. And these people are going to worship him because they're going to see the signs and wonders. Now, if you remember the title of the sermon, I said it's the corrupt or charismatic cult. Now, when you deal with members of a cult, and you start to give them facts and things that they don't like, and you start to show them documentation, what will they do? They will get defensive, and they will start to threaten you. You see, one of the, the prime ways that a cult can exist, and I'd, I'd like to do a, a message on this sometime, cult leaders versus Jesus Christ. Cult leaders are perverts, sex perverts usually, and they're, they're always lazy bums that don't want to work for a living. Muhammad, Buddha, uh, Karl Marx, founder of communism, all these guys, they're all lazy bums. Every single one of them. And they're all perverts, usually. You know, yeah, Joseph Smith, you know, Charles Taze Russell, any of these guys. And, and they, 
one of their th things that they use, one of the greatest ways to control people is through fear. And how do you scare somebody in a religion? You can tell them that you, I control your destiny. And if I tell you that you're going to hell because you disobeyed me, then you're going to go to hell. Now, how do the charismatics do it? How do they threaten? Why, you've blasphemed the Holy Ghost. Right here, I did a video called The Danger of Tongues. This was a couple years ago I put this thing out. And I show in the thing that a witchcraft encyclopedia, they're actually talking about that they are speaking in tongues. And the demons are coming upon these witches and that they speak in tongues. And I said, so watch out, this whole charismatic thing. Just because you hear a tongue, just because you hear somebody rattling off something, doesn't mean it's from the Lord. Quite the contrary. Out of, I printed it out here just as a, for documentation purposes, but it's, Probably about number 10 font. It's not very, well, probably even less than that. But it's 17 pages of comments <laughs> that I have on that thing. Out of 17 pages, I my salvation was threatened 12 times. <laughs> 12 times. You better be careful. You're right on the brink of blaspheming the Holy Ghost. Uh -huh. You know. Yeah, threatening me. Why? Because that's what cults do. When you can't handle the scripture. And I, you know, I give references to our sermon that we had on speaking in tongues. And they're like, you need, to, you need to read the Bible sometime to see what it says about tongues. I'm like, I got the link to the sermon. It's right there. You know, I believe in speaking in tongues, but it's according to what the scripture says. You know, I'm not against, you know, I'm not condemning any kind of speaking in tongues that appeared in the Bible. Yeah. But they threaten. That's what a cult does. Now, how do you deal with people like this? Well, you got to understand that they're spiritually blind. Matthew chapter 15. We're going to hit two more places here in the Bible, and then we're done for today. Matthew chapter 15, verse 14. A lot of material to cover today, so I really didn't hit a whole lot of Scripture here today, but uh, just want to hit two more places, and then we're finished. Matthew chapter 15, verse 14. Jesus speaking here, he says, Let them alone, they, are, they be blind leaders of the blind, and if the blind lead the blind, both shall fall into the ditch. There are certain people that you can't do anything for them. What we read back there in 1 Corinthians 14, If any man be ignorant, let him be ignorant. You know, there are people who are ignorant because they've never been taught, and they can be teachable sometimes. If you run into a charismatic, try to teach them. But if they start pulling off this kind of stuff here, you know, I mean, they had... Uh, you know, some of the people in this thing here, people were like, you know, interesting, I never heard this stuff before. See, now there was somebody who was ignorant, but they're no longer ignorant. Right. And they go and they listen to the sermon, and I get an email saying, hey, that was really good, I never knew that. No problem. But then you get the other people, you know, be careful that you not offend the Holy Spirit. There's one here, and it says, here's another, there's a danger to anyone who calls the Holy Spirit demonic. Shame on you. You are calling God a liar. Repent. <laughs> yeah. I didn't call God a liar. I said, here's a witchcraft encyclopedia, and they're speaking in tongues. I didn't say anything about the Holy Spirit gift there, the sign gift that was given. But sometimes you have people that are just spiritually blind. Zephaniah chapter 1. I'm going to show you the end of spiritual blindness. And of course, you know, Jesus used the analogy there of blindness. Uh, he obviously was not making fun of people that are physically blind. Because there are saved people out there that are physically blind. And a lot of times they can see a lot better than people that are, you know, can see physically, but they can't see spiritually. Zephaniah chapter 1, verse 17. It says here, And I will bring distress upon men, that they shall walk like blind men, because they have sinned against the Lord, and their blood shall be poured out as dust, and their flesh as the dung. Neither their silver nor their gold shall be able to deliver them in the day of the Lord's wrath, but the whole land shall be devoured by the fire of his jealousy. For he shall make, make even a speedy riddance of all them that dwell in the land. You know, these big modern mega churches with all the charismatic stuff that goes on, and like we read earlier there with the Catholics, how they raise their hands and they close their eyes and they'll, they'll yell out and stuff like that, just like professing Christians do. That whole movement, all this stuff, God's going to destroy it. And we're not going to go there, but Revelation chapter 3, verses 14 through 22, you know, the Lord describes these people perfectly. They think that they're rich. They're increased with goods. <laughs> we got this uh, LCBC in this area. They're continually buying properties and building huge mega churches, and just swallowing up the little churches, just going in and just taking people from them. 
like a you know the Walmart of churches or something. You know, <laughs> what's the future of them? Right there, they're blind. I remember the one time they, they showed the pastor. It was on uh, our local news here. They had a, a thing, and they showed the pastor, and he said, he said, we really don't know what God's doing. We're just stepping back and, and letting whatever happen. That's what he said. We really don't know what God's doing with our church. We just stand back and let him, let him go. That's not what the Bible says. The Bible gives us very clear-cut instructions, and this is the way it's supposed to be, and you're supposed to follow it. Yeah. And what happens when you don't? Well, you're walking around like a blind person, spiritually blind. So, be careful. One more thing I'll say before we close out here, and that is in my training, my early training, uh, one of my best teachers was Dr. Peter S. Ruckman, and he had a book, The God Called Preacher, and he said in that book there are three groups, I've said this in other sermons, but I'm going to repeat it again, he said there are three groups of people that if you have them come into your church, kick them out. Don't let them into your congregation. He said, number one, a hyper-Calvinist. A hyper-Calvinist will try to mess up other people. They are messed up in their heads. Don't let them into your congregation. Number two, a hyper-dispensationalist. Also very messed up. And the third was a charismatic. You get somebody that is dead set on this charismania stuff and they're, they're acting like a nut and whatever else, out you go. Well, can't I just come for a little bit? No, get out. <laughs> you know, not interested. So that's going to be it for this morning. Uh, watch out for this movement. It's, huh? Yeah, it did. Yeah. That was the same guy you covered in uh, NIV to KJV, wasn't it? What's that? The, the, the guy who was, he was on the internet and then he was gone. The guy messing around with. Yeah, I did, but uh, I cannot think of that guy's name. Yeah. Well, anyhow. Uh, yeah, any other comments or anything, anything to put into it? All right, well, that's going to be it for this morning then. Beware of false prophets. Beware of the charismatic movement. So that's it. Thank you for listening. All right, well, I've been really wanting to do this message on Joel Olstein, the uh, Your Worst Life Now is what it's going to be called. And I bought a copy of his book, Your Best Life Now, two Wednesdays ago from a Goodwill store here in Pennsylvania. You'd think that they could ship a book from Pennsylvania to Pennsylvania, you know, in a week, maybe, a couple days. Still not here. So, you know, maybe, I don't know, maybe Satan knows I'm going to be doing the message and he sent some of his little servants along or something. They're going to hold it hostage or something. <laughs> Look at this little handwritten note. You know, we have your book. I don't know. So, had a request to do a message on the Charismatics. That's what we're going to be talking about today. Before we get started, though, I want to do a little another... I'll do these occasionally, probably not every week, but another little prophecy update. Uh, just kind of an interesting little statistic here. Years and years ago, I, what was it, 2002 or 2003 when we started, when we went to war with Iraq? 2003. 2003? November, October, November 2003. Well, but the official invasion started in March because there's a reason for that. And, you know... This is an interesting thing. Maybe it's coincidence, maybe not. But the Greek god Mars, which they say March is named after, he was the god of war. And so a lot of the pagans would wait till the month of March to go to war so that their god would bless them. So are we going to go to war with Iran in March? I don't know. <laughs> if we do, I'll tell you what, it's not going to be a, a good thing. It's going to be pretty bad because you know, we're not fighting with a bunch of gorillas or something like that running around it's a very powerful country and it has very powerful allies and it's kind of interesting i had a somebody write to me a while back and they had a bunch of subjects that i should they'd like to hear a sermon on and one of them was how to prepare for world war three but how do you prepare for world war three as a christian well, about the same way that you'd prepare for an accident <laughs> driving down the road and somebody pulls out in front of you and you lock up the brakes and you realize i'm not going to stop in time and there's nowhere to go either side of the road what do you do brace for impact Brace for impact. Amen. <laughs> so, how do you prepare for World War III? Brace for impact. Pray. Trust the Lord. Hey, if we get nuked, well, that's a quick way to heaven. <laughs> so, with that happy, positive thing here this morning, let's get into the message. Now, the title of this message is going to sound like I'm being very mean, but I'm not. It's called The Corrupt Charismatic Cult. Now, I'm not being insulting here. Those are actual descriptions of what the charismatic movement is. Webster's 1828 Dictionary 
defines corrupt as, there's five different definitions here, changed from a sound to a putrid state as by natural decomposition. Spoiled, tainted, vitiated, unsound as corrupt air or bread. Depraved, vitiated, tainted with wickedness. That'll be important later. Debased, rendered impure, changed to a worse state as corrupt language. Not genuine, infected with errors or mistakes. As in the text is corrupt. All right, now what about the word charismatic? Well, actually it doesn't appear in the 1828 dictionary. There's no charismatic back then. but it, So I had to go online and get it here. Uh, charismatic, it says, of, relating to, or con con constituting charisma or charism, as in charismatic gifts. Number two, having, exhibiting, or based on charisma or charism, uh, charismatic leader, and then they have a couple other things there, and they talk about uh, examples of charismatic leader, whatever, whatever. First known use, circa 1868. So there you have your definition of the word uh, char charismatic. What about cult? Again, it didn't appear in the 1828 dictionary, although they say first known use here on the Webster's Online Dictionary, first known use is 1617. I don't know why Webster didn't include it in his dictionary, but that's the way it was. Uh, a couple definitions here, five different ones. Formal religious veneration, a system of religious uh, beliefs and ritual, also its body of adhe adherence, a religion regarded as unorthodox or spurious, also its body of in adherence, a system for the cure of disease based on dogma set forth by its promulgator, uh, great devotion devotion to a person, idea, object, movement, or work. And that's enough for that. Now, does the modern charismatic movement fall into that category? Well, we're going to see about that. Now, what was the foundation of this modern charismatic movement? A lot of people will say it's the Azusa Street Revival back in the early 1900s out in California. Now, is that true? Well, yes and no. The modern charismatic system, yes, but the strange things that people were doing, no. It actually existed before then, and I'm going to show you here. I have a book, The Autobiography of Peter Cartwright, The Backwoods Preacher. Peter Cartwright was a circuit-riding Methodist preacher. He was born in the late 1700s. Uh, he got saved, and I do believe he was a saved man. He, he's quite heretical in some of his beliefs, but I do believe he was a Christian. Right? But he went around, and he was one of the ones that started. He was one of the early preachers in the camp meetings, the big revival meetings. And some of the stuff that was going on there, a lot of people are not aware of. And, you know, when you're young, as a Christian, and you're starting to learn things... You'll hear about the great heroes of the faith, and they are heroes of the faith. I consider him a, a, a good man, but that doesn't mean that they were perfect, All right? And I'm not going to bash the guy and call him a heretic and say he was lost like some of the brethren might, but he had some issues. And you're going to see, in fact, that the modern charismatic system actually did not begin with the Pentecostals. It began with the Methodists. Now, I didn't know, I wasn't aware of that until I actually did this study but you're going to see that today. And in fact, a lot of the 20th century charismatics were Methodists and not Pentecostals. We're going to see about that. Start out here, uh, page 32 of this book by Peter Cartwright. And this is his autobiography, by the way. He wrote it. This is not written about him. And uh, Peter Cartwright, as a Methodist, he did not like Baptists for two reasons. Because Baptists believe in baptism by immersion, as the Bible teaches, you know, there's no sprinkling in the Bible. That's ridiculous. And secondly, we believe in eternal security. And the old-time Methodists did not. They were very much opposed to eternal security. So I'm going to read a couple quotes here. Uh, he says here, They adopted the mode of immersion, the water god of all exclusive errorists. <laughs> uh, and then he's talking about how that some of the people, you know, that they got into other denominations and stuff that weren't Methodist. And this is what he says. Uh, and finally made shipwreck of the faith, fell back, turned infidel, and lost their religion and their souls forever. Oh, hey, give me a break. Nonsense. Absolute nonsense. You are sealed unto, unto the day of redemption. You're not going to lose your salvation. Give me a break. Fall back and lose your religion and your soul. Yeah. But continuing here, page 45. And here he gets into the great revivals. Uh, this is in the early 1800s, and 
It says here, I have seen more than a hundred sinners fall like dead men under one powerful sermon. So people were falling down with the preaching? You say, oh yeah, brother, the power of God was mighty in those revivals. Well, how about the Acts chapter 2 revival? And by the way, the word revival, I don't really recall reading that in the Bible. You know, if, if uh, somebody falls down and they're, and they're dead or whatever, and you do CPR or something, or you shock them or whatever, you say you revived them. You revive a corpse. <laughs> you don't need to revive a living body. Oh, the great revivals. Well, I don't know about that, but, you know, where's this whole thing there? They had 3,000 souls saved in Acts chapter 2. Did any of them fall down? No. Peter preached to them and they said, what must, we do, what, what must we do to be saved? They didn't wham, hit the ground and Peter came over and, you know, knocking them on the head or something. Be slain in the spirit. You know, exactly, yeah. What is this stuff? Continuing on here to the next page, page 46. Now listen to some of this stuff. Now if you've seen some of the modern charismatic movement, they'll do things, they fall down, they do this slate in, in, in the spirit thing, they make weird noises, they'll crawl around on their hands acting like animals, barking, yelling, laughing, doing all kinds of weird things. And people say, oh, that started at the Azusa Street Revival. No, it didn't. Page 46, in this great revival, the Methodists kept moderately balanced, for we had excellent